the importance what the bacterial and the viral diseases get that we don't get. That means parasites don't get. But I still believe in the olden days, this was a coexisting. In the sense, even the veterinary symbol itself is having a parasite. So that snake-like thing that is there, no? that is Dracanculus medinensis, it is one of the zoonotic important uh, nematode parasite. So that was the importance. Even the same holds good for the medical uh, symbol also. That is a nematode parasite. So even then, uh, not going to in detail about it. It is one of the uh, India is one of the highest livestock owner in terms of uh, number of animals. And uh, nowadays it is uh, contributing about uh, 4. almost 5 percent of GVA. This is a concept nowadays. Uh, GDP has gone now. It is a value, grass value added to the. Um, uh, uh, to the production and then in terms of the uh, income it has generated. So whereas uh, the parasitic diseases, again, uh, like uh, even the bacterial and the viral diseases, it is also is having a, a lot of significance. Uh, the control of parasitic diseases in livestock, the poultry is a vital part of uh, health and production management as far as whole livestock management is concerned. So exposure to parasite is getting increased day by day. It is an increasing at an alarming rate. Uh, it is not a sustainable to control parasite in a single way. Nowadays, the concept is integrated management or the involvement of biological agents in the management of parasites or any, any uh, bacterial or viral disease are concerned. So, and why do parasites matter? <coughs> First one is there will be a production loss in terms of uh, maybe in terms of milk production in case of poultry, egg production, in sheep and goat, uh, meat production, the disease and the death they may cause. Some of the parasitic diseases are fatal if not treated in time. And then few of them are zoonotic potential that during the course of uh, my talk I will uh, will explore. So this is a simple diagram. Di uh, uh, so what is the blood loss per day when uh, uh, accountable number of parasites are there? When uh, roundworms are there, they account for uh, the loss of three, 630 ml per day per parasite. So per, per animal, sorry. And the liver flow, that is the facial, if it is there, what is the loss? And the ticks, if they do present in more in number in, on a single host animal, this is an example. So location of parasite, you take any animal, any organ you name, the parasite are located. So yeah, they, are, they are not spared any of the body part. Then who get parasites? Name any animal, all the warm breaded animals, they do suffer from, including human beings, they do suffer from. Parasites. So this is a basic. That you might have known already. That's, I'm not going in detail about it. Basically, two types: endoparasites, ectoparasites. Then why the parasite control is getting tougher nowadays? Uh, we, we know the parasites are there. We know ticks are there. We know flies are there. It is getting tougher day by day as the uh, development of resistance is a concept nowadays. So the unique life cycle of some of the parasites where there is involvement of uh, intermediate force, that is become, uh, becoming difficult in the management of uh, uh, parasites. And then few parasites have a wide host range. They can be present in, say for example, trypnosoma, uh, which is an animal, which is a par the protozoan parasite present everywhere, but a reservoir host is antelope, which is, it is a wild animal. So even if you can eradicate a parasite in the domestic animals, it do exist in the reservoir. So, wide host range is having an uh, impact on the management of parasite. The large number of eggs uh, avoided, I mean to say the uh, majority of the gastrointestinal helminths, the eggs are passed in the feces. A single feces, uh, if it is fostered from an infected animal, is having several eggs. That is also accounting. And then versatile immune evasion strategies by some of the parasites, it is also causing a lot of problem in the management of parasites. Uh, to begin with, helminths. Helminths are uh, uh, basically it classified into roundworms, that is nematodes, flatworms, trematodes, and the tapeworm, that is cestodes. So the effect of helminths on the host, these are the few examples, like a loss of blood, Imancus contartus, which is a worm which measure about uh, maximum of 1 to 1 to 1 to 2 centimeter, a single worm will suck about 0 0.05 ml per day. So say for example, if there are uh, 5,000 worms, 250 is the blood loss for sheep for a single day. Just imagine the severity of blood loss. Uh, the mechanical obstruction, Toxocara white lorum, the Parascara sequorum, when they are present in the intestine of domestic animals, they do cause um, uh, mechanical obstruction. And then in case of Ascaris suum, uh, milk spotted liver will be pimply gut, that is pimples on the gut intestinal surface, uh, whenever the insufficient stomach inflections are there. Then these are the few images. This is fasciola, the amphistome, cystosoma, where snail is the male culprit. You name any trematode, 
it is transmitted only by snail no snail no trematode that point you have to remember and then uh, this is an example where uh, which is an inf animal infected with amphistomes where there is a bottle just submandibular edema which is accountable both in uh, facial osis and amphistomosis and then uh, this is an image uh, affect in a, a facially infected liver where you can see the bile duct and then uh, these are the few images of uh, prostogonimus which is a poultry stored so for a trematode you have to use tri triclobendazole which is effective for all the stages it is effective for the ovi uh, eggs it is effective for uh, different larval stages and it, it is effective for adult stage of trematode whereas rifaxanoid and cloxiclonal can also be used but uh, better to use triclobendazole for and for all the trematodes because regular benzimidazole what we give albendazole fenbendazole uh, won't take care of this parasite so in that context it becomes important the management of snail is very important here a few of the images i have mentioned here uh, in the pond if we, if we can rare guppy fish or gourami fish these are the two uh, uh, genera of species of fish which feed on the uh, miracidium or the larval stages of uh, cystosoma and fasciola so it will take care and the rearing of ducks directly these ducks feed on the snails so no snail no trematode concept will hold good here and then um, rearing of plants like uh, neem eucalyptus maybe soap berries in and around the ponds or the water sources where the animals are going regularly for drinking purpose so drinking water uh, for drinking water that you can uh, you can rear these the plants where the leaves and the stems they do fall on the water surface so where it is having a molluscicidal effect that means uh, snail killing ability they do have and then uh, clearing of vegetation around the ponds where the water sources are it is also equally mandate where uh, because the snails they get uh, uh, um, they get lodged in that area quite often and cystosoma uh, this might have known or uh, 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 bullocks are are uh, very highly at risk uh, snoring is a condition disease name so nasal cystosomiasis is a condition so the earlier days lithium antimony tartrate nowadays prazoquintal is giving good result you can go for that also 20 mg per kg it is giving good result with no side of because uh, lithium antimony tartrate sometimes you, you may not be having in your uh, bag uh, uh, so you have to purchase and all and then uh, deep intramuscular is the suggested route that to if the, if you have to give 20 ml 10 ml on the each sides sometimes a little painful also we can uh, go with the prazoquintal it has given good result you can uh, go with that the tapeworms uh, large animals are not high, at high risk but whereas for sh uh, small ruminants like sheep and goat invariably if you do any post mortem you will get uh, this in monizia you will get in the small intestine so yeah sheep and goat and the poultry are at high risk and then uh, this is an image uh, of dog fecal sample having diphyllidem caninum that is a pumpkin seed like structure or cooked rice grain like segment if the same uh, pumpkin seed like structure or cooked rice grain like segment if you can appreciate in uh, sheep fecal sample it is monizia whereas in case of dog it should be diphyllidem caninum for this uh, one of the important clinical sign is anal scooting animal will drag its anus because while dropping from the anal uh, these gravid segments they do cause a sort of irritation in order to avoid the irritation the dog will drag its anus down the ground so for this condition uh, you have uh, so you, uh, you have to treat with uh, either prazoquintal or niclosamide because these are the proper anti trematodal drugs anti trematodal drugs prazoquintal can be employed in any of the parasitic diseases but properly it is main, mainly meant for anti cystodal purpose rifaxanoid sorry niclosamide and prazoquintal are the drug of choice this is an image of cysticercosis in uh, cystic sarcosis cyst in pig this intentionally i put here because it is sort of having a public health significance in the sense the pork eating uh, uh, persons who are uh, having eating have a habit of eating pork some are uh, having the habit of taking uh, um, properly cooked or raw pork as it is so these are the points you have to look this cystic sarcosis in human beings the pigs are the main source of infection whenever the pigs are reared in a uh, uh, backyard sort of rearing um the when uh, when the pigs are having access to human feces this is this is a point we have to intervene so in kerala even though it is a pork eating state ma mainly in india pork is mainly eaten uh, in the northeast even in the kerala a few cases of human cystic sarcosis are reporting because the backyard rearing of pigs is completely banned in kerala they rear in a intensive system only so in that condition even though eat pork also it is not a problem here but in uh, 
state like Karnataka where uh, their picks are more more often the less in a back rearing system where they will catch somebody will come and catch and they will eat so this is a problem so then neurocystosarcosis uh, this is uh, something related to human beings uh, so I, I mean I placed a photograph of Leandro Pace here because one of the you know, finest tennis player India have ever produced he do had this problem his father was a medical doctor uh, he used to have a lot of migraine around uh, uh, in the early 2000. So what happened? Uh, he took him to US, UK, wherever it is. Uh, uh, that, that was not cured at all. Uh, finally, they came to Bangalore, Nimans, where, where he underwent CT scan. He could be able to diagnose with nearest circus. So he had a habit of eating uh, uncooked pork, raw as it is. So, so that was, it was treated in time. If it is diagnosed in time, cur curability is there. Surgical intervention it need not be uh, even with the medication also, it is possible to cure. So proper diagnosis matters a lot. I intentionally put a vegetable photo here because even the vegetarians are also at risk. Don't feel that vegetarians are at safe because nowadays, so in the, uh, wherever the rivers you are there, uh, uh, neighborhood only, they will uh, rear uh, vegetables where the pigs, they defecate. If it is not washed properly and consumed by the human beings, there is a possibility. So entering of cyst is, is a very important uh, a point as far as the human beings are concerned. So treatment for, uh, for any cestodal, this is what I, I told, prosequintal or neclesomat, it must be there. And then management of intermediate host also account in the management of cestodes. Nematodes, this is quite common because it is easy to spread because it is a direct life cycle. There is no involvement of any intermediate host. Through the ingestion of contaminated feed and water only, these are being transmitted. Main uh, uh, nematodes are Toxicara whitelorum, canis, Ascarisuum, Hemonchus, Ostostasia species, the life cycle is also short. Uh, these are the few images where uh, you can say the pathognomonic <coughs> point of view. Ascari, this is an uh, image of a pig liver which is infected with Ascaris worm, milk spotted liver. As if milk has been sprinkled on the liver, that is the way it looks. And then this is uh, Parascaris equorum. It, it causes a severe intestinal obstruction. Whatever the food is taken, it is not passed out. So the parasite, they get entangled in the intestine. It is a problem again. Sometimes there is a possible rupture of intestine peritonitis and the death of animal. This is an image, a very good image showing a Toxacara vitellorum infection, passing mud colored feces. The point is that within less, uh, three, less than three months old only, you can get this Toxacara patent infection. If the animal consumes if a Toxacara egg after six months old, it is not causing any patent infection. Only in young, anim young animals, and the problem is also that Toxicara vitellorum mainly transmitted by transcholesterol route. That is the only route of main mode, uh, mode of transmission as far as Toxicara vitellorum is concerned. This is an uh, pimply gut nodules on the intestine. And this is an image of gaping. Singama strachea, when it is there, uh, the animal gaping position will be there. And then this is an image of an um, uh, abomasum where uh, Moracal other appearance, osteostasia infection. This is dire failure. This is an infection, uh, equine having infection of uh, auxurus equi. So the rat tail appearance uh, will be there. And the last one is Thelesia, Thelesia rhodesi. So let us be practical here. You cannot have an animal which is parasite free. That point you should know in the beginning itself because uh, you cannot cure, because in the, in, the, in the food chain where the survivability life cycle goes on, you cannot have, like, practically it is impossible. Our goal is not a creation of parasite free animal, but prevention of clinical disease and then the damage caused by it. The gastrointestinal nem uh, nematode infection has to be managed and it is not possible to eradicate at all. So integrated uh, parasite management uh, will come in the way. So there are two aspects. One is use of chemical method, that is use of deworming agents, and then a non-chemical method that is purely managemental. So in the management, uh, as I mentioned, the, most of the gastro nematodes, the main mode of transmission is ingestion of contaminated feed and water. So provision of clean pasture and the clean uh, shed, then mainly feeder height should be above the knee level of an animal because if it is uh, below the ground level, if the feces is passed accidentally when it turns, so fecal contamination with the pasture and the drinking water is the main source of infection as far as the gastrointestinal nematode is concerned. And then host immunity also matters and the provision of high protein on the energy diets. So what it does, it will uh, improve a sort of uh, immunoglobulin IgA, which is a sort of, muco it causes a mucosal edema. So attachment of parasite becomes a little difficult. If we give high protein diet and the energy diets, it will help to build the parasite, uh, immunity against the parasite. And then pasture rotation, pasture rest period. 
pasture rest is very important. We do suggest, but the uh, 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 livestock owners and come and say, we are given the rest for 15 days. Again, the parasite, animal has picked up parasitic infection. The proper resting period should be two months. 60, 60 days is the pasture rest period, pasture rotation if you want to do. So this is the proper rate. And then for goats, better to go with silvy pasture, tree feeding ability, because they do feed on the uh, silvy pasture is the main mode, which has to be avoided as far as the uh, goat is concerned and multi-species grazing. That means uh, in the same uh, pasture, you can allow the different uh, group of animals like uh, cattle and buffaloes together. After some time, after two months, you can allow sheep and goat because some parasites which are pathogenic to cattle and buffaloes may not be pathogenic to sheep and goat. That concept can be employed. And then uh, cattle and buffaloes, they act as a vacuum cleaner as far as the pasture is concerned. If it is grazed before or after the sheep and goat, this is what the multi-species uh, uh, grazing accounts. The other uh, grazing management, one more important point, so you have to flow the land soon after the, uh, uh, allowing the animal to feed. So if it is uh, dry land, you have to flow it properly because when you flow it only, the fecal material which is having, the eggs will come out and then due to exposure to sunlight, they get disrupted. Some of the, most of the eggs, not some of the, most of the eggs, they do get disrupted with the proper sunlight. And then tannin-rich forages, tannin-rich forages, 100% like chicory is an example which is having highly rich in uh, tannin, so it will help in the management of gastrointestinal parasites. And then uh, grazing time, this is very, very important. Early morning, majority of the nematode parasites, they are negatively phototropic, sorry, uh, negatively geotropic, positively phototropic. That means they to move towards the light in the light intensity light. That is early in the morning or late in the evening, the larvae of these parasites, they try to crawl upon. So that is called as negatively geotropic, positively phototropic effects. So they can move up to maximum of 10 centimeter. So if you cut the forage or the any uh, material which is to fit to be uh, uh, feeding to the animal, you have to cut above the 10 centimeter level. Or else if you are allowing animal in the free range system, you have to allow the animal only after 10 o'clock.